In the last two weeks, the University of Ghana has been in the center of a media storm after BBC Africa Eye released a documentary titled Sex for Grades. Two of the university's professors were caught in compromising situations in the documentary. In the midst of all that came a lady, Andrea Pizzicone, who accused the Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana of unsavory remarks and behavior, which was initially construed as sexual harassment. She came back later to say she was not harassed by the Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana. Since then, there's been a lot of drama around the case. I am Nuong Falong, and today on Hot Issues, we have the lady at the center of the drama, Andrea Pizzicone, here to give us more insight into the whole case. Today on Hot Issues, we have Andrea Pizziconi on the seat. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Hot Issues on TV3. Thank you for having me. Let's look at sexual harassment in general. How would you describe sexual harassment? You know, it's interesting. I've had to reflect on this quite a bit since um, the first round of media responses, because in my original statements, I never used the term sexual harassment. I um, called out exactly what was said to me by the vice chancellor and about me. Um, I chose not to characterize it. I just allowed it to be judged on the merit. This is not somebody that I worked for. You, you do agree, however, that harassment does not only occur between a superior and a subordinate. I do agree, and I, and I agree that the statements were deeply inappropriate, and the statements now, they are so defamatory that they would be upheld in a court of law as defamatory. That's a disturbing statements, and what they are at the core, and I think that we can agree on this, it's all about an abuse of power. So Regardless of the paradigm of employee, employer, professor, student, they are all symptoms of abuse of power. Let's look at the yes. contract in general. Can you tell us a bit about the contract? Sure. So in, uh, in late 2013, my co the company that I founded, Africa Integras, was invited by the University of Ghana to consider a public-private partnership contract. This was after the university had unsuccessfully sought out a, a similar developer, um, and they held a conference and had 100 participants, and they did not find a suitable developer. My company's niche expertise is university facilities development and financing. So they reached out to us. Um, we spent uh, upwards of three, two to three years doing the underwriting and the due diligence on the project together with the former vice chancellor and his team. I should note, and this is very important, the U.S. government was the financier of the project, and they undertook scrupulous due diligence on the contract. There's been a lot of accusations made that this contract was a, a fly-by-night decision um, that was not scrutinized, but um, the U.S. government uh, leaves no rock unturned when they scrutinize and analyze potential contracts that they finance. This was one of them. Let's go back to um, the accusations you made in your Twitter post. Sure. Right. Now, you do not think he harassed you? So I'm, I've, you know, I've decided that I'm not going to, I'm not going to put the word on it. I would rather that the, the actions be judged. So but, but how can the actions me. be judged if, if there's no yeah, definition? So after an, a, a year, an agonizing year of trying to get the, to receive myself and my team constructively, most of the time he just declined to meet me, which I thought was strange because I am the decision maker in the project representing Africa Integra. We have invested, I've personally invested millions in the project, and, and, and on behalf of investors as well. Other investors obviously invested tens of millions. And so we thought it was strange that he wouldn't receive me. At one point, he even said to a con colleague, um, you are welcome to bring a delegation. Anyone but Andrea is welcome to come, which was strange. Why do you think he was so against you? Well, I mean... I, I don't know and I don't want to presume at the time it felt like misogyny. Um, it felt strange. I had only met him a few times. 
but um, I didn't want to presume. Then we fast forward a few months. He finally receives myself and my colleague. Um, we are there in, in Ghana. We're having a group meeting. And in the group meeting, he then ends the meeting by saying, he walks over to me, you are far too pretty to worry your little head project. And then he jokes and he says, step away, everyone. Um, turn around, everyone. Sorry. I'd like to give her a proper hug. So did he Which give you a hug? He did give me a hug. Yes, he, he did? did. Um, yes, he did. Did it make he you uncomfortable? Um, I think that obviously as a seasoned professional who has worked around the world and is respected for my acumen and skills, the, the entire comment made me deeply uncomfortable, especially juxtaposed with the fact that he had dismissed me for so long when the contract was in termination and thousands of lives were at stake in terms of being able to have an education at the University of Ghana. So the whole thing made me uncomfortable. Um, fast forward three months where we are now at an even deeper impasse. And, and mind you, this whole time I'm trying to offer solutions to reconcile moving forward with their default on the project so that we can just finish the building. Um, and we offered all number of, of potential solutions. And this is a, a and, and I would like to point out his characterization of the rent is completely false. He said somewhere on the radio that the rent is 25 million a year. The first year of rent on the project was less than, um, was, was less than $8 million. So you're saying uh, the details, so that you're that, saying that the details he gave were false. Correct, correct. And so he used that, I think, to mischaracterize it and defame the project and myself. So fast forward three months, there's a meeting of council. We had been told that the reason why he could not act on his obligations was because he was waiting to have a council constituted. People may recall there had not been a council for six months with the new government. Um, now there's a council. And in his presentation to the council, he, he confidently states that I, of all people, have told him that, the, that he uses this to justify, this is a very important detail. We were eligible for significant GIPC incentive benefits. As part of the original contract, all of those benefits went back to the university in the form of reduced rent. And they were significant benefits. Do you think his perception of you and the comments he made towards you in any way directly hurt the contract? Well, let me explain. So I'll try to explain more briefly. In the meeting of council, he had to justify why he refused to sign the final document required for the university to benefit from the GIPC benefits. And he said, I didn't sign it because she told me that the contract was signed in a hotel room between herself and my predecessor, and that is deeply inappropriate. And was the contract signed and in a hotel room? The contract was signed on live television in front of 500 people. I'm fairly positive the vice chancellor might have been in attendance. So you're, saying, in front of everyone. So, so you're saying the vice president, uh, the vice chancellor lied about the details of the contract? Correct. That is what I'm saying. Why do you think he would do a thing like that? You know, I honestly think that Part of this had nothing to do with me originally. I think that there might be a personal issue between himself and his predecessor. I think that he equally has a deep, entrenched bias against women based on his interactions with So me. you would call him misogynistic? Assume, would you call him misogynistic? Yes. yes. There's no doubt that anybody that goes on national radio, as he did last week, to proselytize, as he did, that I told him, which is, of course, a lie. Um, I, I can say exactly what I said that is remotely close to that statement. But even the insinuation that he made that I tried to meet him alone, which of course as a business person is a very appropriate thing to offer, to say, we are the two decision makers. Why don't we both sit down together and work these issues out? To insinuate that I was somehow throwing myself upon him, as he insinuated in the legal arguments he made for why the pro when the project went into dispute resolution, at some point the argument was made that it was signed under coercion. This person then also held a convocation meeting as recently as this past July, and the entire meeting was about me trying to prove that I was corrupt. I don't think people realize that he even launched an Inyoko investigation against myself and his predecessor. It's Did been you two years, they have found nothing.
Did you ever meet the vice chancellor before you had to interact with him for this contract? Um, I met him at the day of his inauguration. So you didn't know him prior? No, I did not know. Oh, no, that's not true, actually. I, he was involved in the approval of the project. I did not have significant engagement with him. I don't remember um, the, the significance of any conversations. But he was, at the time, the dean of the, the School of Basic and Applied Science. And each of those deans had to approve the drawings that were involved in the buildings that we were building. So he was involved in some of the academic board meetings that approved the project, where we presented. Do you think his actions affected the cancellation of the contract? His, he unilaterally canceled this contract. And he had advisors surrounding him who were telling him, you have duly, the university has duly signed a contract. There are significant I want to be clear, the university stood to benefit from a $450 million surplus. After a consideration of the rent, the university made additional $400 as a result of this additional infrastructure that we were building, its capacity for 19,000 students. And despite all of his advisors that we met with many times telling him, please proceed with the contract, he decided single-handedly not to. And, of course, his decision went through dispute resolution, and it ended in a judgment of $166 million against the university because of his foolish decision. Now, if you had to explain, why do you personally think the contract was cancelled? Do you have personal reasons? You know, I think it was a combination of perhaps personal issues that he might have had with his predecessor. Perhaps he didn't understand the contract. Perhaps he didn't believe that, that, a, that a woman who looked like me and who was as young as I was, as I am, uh, could have accomplished such a feat as to originate and close and finance such a project could be a combination of those reasons. Uh, you had a bit of uh, confusion between yourself and the media uh, when you said you did not yes. use sexual harassment. The media used that word. But um, let's look at the context in which the statement was released. The discussion was about sex for grades. There were two lecturers. Right. There were two lecturers of the University of Ghana who had been captured in compromising situations in the video. And so, when you come out and then you make a statement and you give details of the statement, did his actions and comments ever make you feel uncomfortable? Well, they did. But I, if I can, I'd love because I've had time to reflect since that confusion of last week. And I'd like to draw the connection better in terms of sex for grades. And I'd first like to state, um, I'm speaking as a survivor. So not only when I was in college did I have a professor pressure me, and I took the bad grade, and I, and I chose not to succumb to the pressure, but I didn't tell anyone at the time because I thought I won't be believed. But I'm also a survivor When, when you say you succumbed to the pressure, what, what do you mean? Um, oh, it was an example of a, a professor who was having dinner with all of his students. He invited us all to his home, and, uh, and I happened to be sitting next to him at the dinner, and under the table, he put his hand in my lap inappropriately, and I froze, and I, I excused myself, and I, I, I said nothing, and then he gave me a bad grade on my final report, and he sent me an email, and he said, I think you'll disagree with my assessment of your work. You're welcome to come to my office hours to discuss it. I knew what that implied, and I chose not to go to the office hours. I took the bad grade. Did you feel compromised by his comments? I did not feel that the vice chancellor was, was foolish enough. In my assessment, I did not feel he was foolish enough to actually aggressively pursue me and but you, you think there was some interest there? You think he had some interest in you? I don't want to insinuate because I think that the stakes are too high. I think that this is somebody who dismissed me as a pretty face, who was not a, a respected counterparty to him. And the point that I wanted to make, the way that he defamed me, the accusations that he's made repeatedly, that the only way I could have possibly accomplished what I did was by sleeping with someone. They're very related to what these young women are. Because it's a little bit of the old adage, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, having survived assault um, myself, uh, I didn't say anything for many years because I didn't believe that I would be believed. 
And I wanted so badly to avoid exactly what this vice chancellor has done, which is to accuse me of, of something so untoward. And then it turned out that after all of these years of being quiet, it didn't matter um, because misogyny, it's this abuse of power. They're all related to each other. And, and that's the point that I was trying to make, is that if women think that this doesn't affect, this was, this was what was told to me. When he said those comments about me, and this was two years ago, so I kept quiet for quite some time. Mm. When he made those comments, I asked um, an official, how could he say such a thing? And, and the person advised me because he believes it, because he's used, so used to growing up and seeing in his career sex for grades, that he believes there's no way that you could have ever accomplished what you did unless, unless you offered yourself. Thank you so much, Andrea. We'll be going for a quick break. When I come back, we'll continue with you. Welcome back to Hot Issues on TV3. We have been speaking with Andrea Pizzicone, the lady at the center of accusations against the vice chancellor of the University of Ghana. She is positive that the vice chancellor's comments were misogynistic, sexist, and a few more colorful words. And she believes his actions and his comments led directly to the cancellation of the contract between Africa Integras and the University of Ghana. We continue our conversation. When the contract was cancelled, what reasons did the university give you for cancelling the contract? Well, let's see. I want to be clear about this information. The contract was terminated because the university defaulted on one of its obligations to provide sufficient security for the contract. Okay. What makes it relevant, what the vice chancellor's, his, his, what makes his conduct relevant is the fact that we offered myriad remedies as far as to remedy it by saying, would you like to renegotiate the rent? Let's renegotiate the rent, which is something that he has often said in the media was, was his reason for canceling that this was a contract that enslaved the university. These are, he used very colorful terms. Because he refused all manner and forms of, of recon reconciliation or ways to, um, to remedy the investment partner, W.P. Carey, chose to pursue their rights to, um, to dispute resolution, which led to a judgment against the university. And this was against his counsel. At the time, his counsel had assured us, thank you for offering these many solutions. We will go with this solution. And the vice chancellor will agree. And then that just didn't happen. And at the, at the seminal meeting, when he was supposed to present the options for how to proceed, that was when he instead made the argument that it was signed in a hotel room. And therefore, it was signed under coercion and was not a properly constituted contract, which, of course, is completely false. Interesting. Now, now somebody sent in a comment um, when this whole incident began and she said in as much as sex for grades is real and must be addressed we should be mindful of some people who will use this label to make false allegations to settle scores and this was a comment from from somebody affiliated with the university do you do you um what do you think about being accused of trying to use the opportunity I, to set, I mean, settle I, scores i i think that there's that expression um CYA, um, and I think people know what it means. I, I think that they are, I, I, I'm, it is unfortunate that people feel that my speaking up to say, I believe these young women because I know what it's like to not be believed, and I know what it's like to be defamed when you come and speak up. Um, and also, I know what it's like when you are dismissed because of your looks or presumed in some way. And, and the purpose of this is to say to every career woman who thinks that sex for grades is not about them, it is about them because every single accomplishment that we achieve is being put under question because there is a pandemic crisis of sex for grades. And as those young women graduate, all women are put under suspicion. And that is the direct line. All of this is part of an ecosystem of an abuse of power that is based on gender disparity. So the comments made by the university, I think, are convenient for them. They're trying to protect their reputation, and I think they find themselves in a very difficult moment right now. Did you, did you try to use the opportunity to settle scores? 
Not at all. So, so for me, the score was settled by the $166 million judgment against the vice chancellor. If there was ever a question of who was at fault, it was completely resolved at that point by that expert. Um, in terms of why I spoke up later, and, and, and again, he continues to pursue me, um, you know, with the press releases and whatnot, which was, is strange. But I spoke up because I have so often seen these young women disbelieved. And as a result of, of this experience that I had, it forced me to deeply reflect on what could I do um, to, to re- address this issue. And so we, we launched Girls First Finance which we were, cho- we were already coincidentally launching in a few days anyway, on the Day of the Girl. And the purpose of that was to give young women tools. Um, this is a free app that, um, that gives them tools to be able to protect themselves, defend their reputation, record memories if they have been um, abused or assaulted confidentially for themselves, connect with other women uh, who have been abused, um, and also just manage their finances to empower themselves so that they don't have to fall into the whole sponsors issue, which is a related issue to sex for grades as well. So um, let's establish a few facts. You, you, believe mm-hmm. the, you believe the vice chancellor was sexist. You have also stated some misogyny in there. Uh, you have also used other words. Now, um, you also admitted that his comments made you uncomfortable. You also think his comments and his attitude were directly linked to the loss of the contract, and yet you say he did not sexually harass you. So I, I think that the point that you're insinuating is a very fair one. Why am I not using that word? You know, somebody asked me, somebody made an analogy to me that I think is very interesting. If a woman is being abused by her husband, and someone calls the police and says he's beating her up, and the woman says, no, no, he's not beating me up, then does she get the right to say it's not abuse? If somebody else can call it out and say, but that is abuse. And I think that um, one could argue. So, so are you saying it's abuse, but you're not calling it abuse? It's definitely abuse of power. I'm definitely saying that. I'm saying that your suggestion that this is harassment and we should call it harassment is a fair one. It's just that that isn't what I said at the time. And the issue that I had with the media was them putting words in my mouth at that time. They didn't allow me to characterize the story as I would have. Um, but I think that through this discussion... But, but the, media, the media was yes. interpreting what you wrote. The media was summarizing what I wrote. Yes, which um, directly and, and pointed to the, harassment. Um, the, the point is I didn't use the word. I chose to fight a different battle. So um, are you and, saying and, it's but harassment, the, but you did not use the word harassment? I think that one could fairly deduce, based on definitions of law, of what harassment is, that that would be included in harassment. I didn't say it at the time that it was harassment. Are you, are you said saying it, it now? Um, I, think that, uh, I think that you could, you could argue that upon reflection, what I want to do is I, I want to contribute positively to the discussion and say it is worthy for us all to discuss what constitutes, constitutes harassment. And those are deeply disturbing comments. And I'm going to be reflecting deeply on how, in in a court of law, those would be considered, those comments, especially in light of the influence they had on the contract. Don't you think it derails the dialogue when the victim refuses to put a description to her experience? I think that that's a very fair point. But I think that one can also look at that, and, and let's just think about why, though. Why would a victim do that? Look at what happened to me over the last week, the trolling that happened, the incredibly defamatory statements that were made from him and from others about me because I spoke up. If you were a young woman at the University of Ghana who had been mistreated by a professor, what lesson would that teach you? Would you want to speak up now and, and tell your story, looking at what happened to a woman who has relative privilege and agency by nature of being more advanced in my career and, and, and whatnot, I, the answer would be no, which is very, um, which is horrible. So you're right, probably doesn't help. And it's why I am trying to be so thoughtful with my words. And you're right, but by, by definition of law, that would be harassment. If I am you're listening. Right about that, and you're right, to, you're right to poke me on that. If I am listening to you correctly, then you're saying that you are afraid of calling it harassment. 
I'm not going to use the word fear because I'm not afraid. I want there to be a healthy discussion. Um, in my case, um, my understanding of harassment at the time is that there had to be a direct relationship of power, i.e. an But you do not think there was a direct relationship? There was a, a relationship with power over here, wasn't there? There was a contract. You're right about that. Listen, I think that you could easily make the case that, I think one could easily make the case that that was harassment. I wish at the time that the media had allowed me to, to tell the story and, and paraphrase it, but you know what? Things happen for a reason, and, and this has led to a thoughtful discussion about this issue. And one thing is very clear. There, there were different comments made about me backtracking or running away. I'm right here. Are you Just running like away? Are you backtracking? Definitely not. Are Definitely you afraid? Not. The state, not at all. But I'm you did say in a court of law it would be called harassment. Um, in a court of law, what he said, um, I read about it, I, read, I actually looked on Google this morning, and I read it. In fact, I don't know if this is going to work, but I read a list, and I, I sent it to myself, of what constitutes harassment in law. And on the list of what constituted harassment, there were two lines that stuck out at me, and, those, and I'll read them, um, because they were, to me, so, uh, you know, they were so I I interesting. Unwanted sexual teasing, jokes, remarks, or questions, telling lies, or spreading rumors about a person's personal sex life. So this was an FAQ that was given in, in the U.S., mind you. This is U.S. context. This was an FAQ that was distributed to give examples of sexual harassment so that employees would avoid them. So based on that, those two things that I just read, and there were many others, this was a list of 20 different examples, including standing too close, touching or rubbing oneself, um, staring at someone inappropriately. I mean, some of these are very nuanced. Um, but in that court of law, or, or in this um, interpretation of law, they would constitute harassment. I guess my point is, um, I was, at the time, I didn't want to distract from this bigger issue um, of sex for grades, but also abuse of power. But, it but, but your like, story is important uh, also. It is important, and you're right about that. And, and, I, and I'm, I want to be accountable to you. You and others are, are trailblazing and, and having difficult discussions. You're strong women. And, and, I've, and I submit my story humbly so that it can lead to good. Um, I've already been defamed. I have, at this point, I have nothing to lose. This person has already accused me of this to the world publicly. So I have everything to lose by being quiet. Um, I have everything to gain in terms of my, my respect and dignity for myself to defend my honor and speak up. Do you think, I'm blessed to do you be have in intentions? Do, so. do, you, do you have intentions of pursuing this in any other way besides speaking up? Of pursuing this in any other way? Um, I will be reviewing my options. Why don't we say that? But, but what I will say is this, this issue, um, so Girls First Finance is a pretty significant investment that I've made and that others are making. I'm definitely pursuing it there. I will also say I'm already in touch and I've been invited by different governments who care about this issue to talk about a framework agreement that we have drafted and that others are interested in that will look at what constitutes a safe campus and what, are, what is the criteria of a safe campus and how can we enforce a safe campus. And we are currently advocating that bilateral donors start to, and, and they are welcoming this work, that they start to look at whether universities sign up to an independent, objective um, framework agreement to police themselves or to be policed around this issue as, as, as a, a condition of funding. Thank you so much, so Andrea. I think that will be very powerful. Thank you for joining us. That will be all oh. for today. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. for having me. Thank you for staying with us on Hot Issues on TV3. I am your host, Nuong Falong. We've been speaking with Andrea Pizzicconi, the lady who accused the vice chancellor of unsavory remarks and behavior. Now she says upon reflection, she does see that in a court of law, his actions could actually be called sexual harassment. And upon reflection, she does see that she was harassed by the vice chancellor. Thank you for staying with us. Let's keep the conversation going on social media, on hot issues, hashtag hot issues. Have a good afternoon.